Good morning. Uh, great to see everybody. I uh, have a question for you. Um, how many people have read a book in the past month? Yeah, nobody has the guts to say they didn't read a book. Good, good. All right. Um, so if when you read that book, how did you read it? Did you read, uh, if you read it in paper, raise your hand. Okay. Audio book. A few. Woo. All right. Uh, Ebook. Cool. So we still have mostly paper crowd, even in a digital um, space like this, right? Uh, that's kind of what, what we found in, uh, in doing a book um, this time. Uh, I did a book about, uh, I did a couple books a decade ago and uh, was so sort of um, beat up by the process that I swore I'd never do another one. Uh, but I uh, came up with a uh, sort of a better way, what I thought was a, a, a sort of more uh, digital way to do a book um, for, for this time around. Uh, so started with a project last year um, called Follow the Geeks that is about the fact uh, that so much of the world uh, is changing, right, is in motion. And the digital world has transformed media uh, in so many ways. Um, you know, news. Uh, I used to have these these arguments with uh, my professors uh, in college. I was in college in the 90s when I was in journalism school. And I used to say, this was just when the internet had kind of just come up. And I'd say, you know, this is destined to be the future of media. And my college professors at the time, who, who really taught me everything and were great about 90% of stuff, but were really clueless about uh, the internet and the impact it would have on media. They used to say, no, you know, they tried that down in Florida with some Macs and HyperCard, and people just don't want to read on screens. Uh, you know, the, the newspaper will always be there. And I was like, and I was just like, look, I know I'm just a kid, but, uh, you know, it's so much cheaper to distribute it um, over the Internet. Like, it's, it's instantaneous. You don't have to wait for the paper to come in the morning. Like, there's no way that paper can compete with this. Like, no, that people, we tried that. That's not a thing. Um, so, uh, but obviously it has become a thing, and it's transformed every um, bit of media, right? You look, at, um, you look at newspapers, you look at magazines, you look at marketing, um, you look at all of these things. But one of the areas that has changed very little uh, is books, is book publishing, um, as we can see by the, the show of hands, still the majority of people when they read are reading in paper, right? And not um, digitally. Uh, so while things like the Kindle and other e-readers have, have made an impact and, and are making an impact, and sort of thankfully for, for kids that used to have to carry piles of books around and now um, in some cases can carry you know, tablets or, or e-readers, um, you know, that's a great thing, but by and large, you know, books are, uh, are still very much uh, the same as they have been since Gutenberg uh, created the printing press. And uh, they're very untouched by uh, digital transformation in many ways. Um, the e-reader is really just a little bit thinner, easier, more portable um, version of something that's happened for a long, long time. So with that in mind, um, yeah, I looked at, uh, I have a, a co-author, uh, Lindsay Gilpin. Um, we sort of looked at, I, I had sort of pitched a number of people on this idea of like, you know what, I'm not, people would ask me about, you know, writing a book, um, which if you're a writer, you know, that's something that they ask you all the time. Are you going to do a book? And I would always say, because I'd done a couple books the old-fashioned way, I'd say no. Like, it, it, you know, you, you spend so much time doing this. Um, you um, make very little, um, almost no books make money. 90% of books uh, don't make money. Um, and the, um, the authors uh, make very little. Uh, the publishers and the, the um, booksellers make all the money. And uh, there's just not a whole lot of incentive to do it other than having your name on a book. And you, know, you do it for kind of promotional reasons to establish yourself as an expert and that kind of thing, right? Um, so I said, no, I, I don't want to do that again. Um, but I said, but if I did, I would do it totally differently because the way that, uh, the way that you do books now, there are a number, number of problems with it. And one um, here, uh, authors make bupkis. Uh, you know, you put all the time in. 
Um, and you know, book publishing is built for this age where this old sort of paradigm of, of capital and, um, and labor, right? Where you know, um, capital had to put all this money in. Publishing a book is an expensive thing, um, or it used to be. And so um, that's why it was justified that, uh, or, or that was a justification that the publishers and the booksellers made all the money. Um, that's not the case now, right? The, the economics have, have changed considerably um, with publishing on demand, with self-publishing, um, uh, and with uh, you know, the power of promotion uh, that you can get through other means than just an, uh, a um, publisher buying airtime or sending out um, copies of the book to, to people hoping that they'll write about it, all that kind of thing. So the economics have changed. So but authors still make bupkis on a you know twenty to thirty dollar hardcover book. You know an author makes about a dollar on every one um, that is sold, uh, despite the fact of having put you know a year to two years of uh, of their life in it and and all of that. And the publishers and booksellers, you know, they put some time and some resource toward these things, but um, uh, but it's not weighted. It's it's still heavily weighted in their favor. Uh, the book publishing process also has way too much lag. So. Now, you can imagine in areas where that, that change very quickly, uh, you know, a book, you're typically researching it for at least about a year, sometimes two, sometimes more. Um, and then you're giving it to the publisher. They go through their process. You know, they get it in their catalog. They plan out, you know, um, the way it's going to be published. That process often takes six months to a year. So from the time that you start researching, to the time that that thing comes out is two years, right? World changes pretty quickly in two years these days, especially if you're doing nonfiction um, and that kind of thing. So your book is often outdated by the time you, you release it. That's a big problem. Um, the other bit uh, that's really sort of interesting about a book is it really is this kind of ivory tower thing, right? If like an expert goes off, they study something, and then they, you know, share their wisdom with the masses. Um, how many of you sort of have a, a favorite author, you know, an author that you really, you know, like, you, you read their stuff regularly and that kind of thing? How many have ever sort of had any kind of contact with that offer, author? Okay, three. Um, exactly. So authors, the gap between authors and readers is pretty significant. And similar to like what Dan was talking about, where now you know you don't think of you know sharing this wisdom um, with someone or you know descending your wisdom on the masses, right? Uh, media today is a lot more about conversations. Books are not conversations, um, and rarely ever have been. And that's a huge missed opportunity, right? Because anytime you're writing for an audience you're writing and you're assuming some kind of, um, especially in nonfiction, you're assuming some kind of knowledge or shared knowledge with that audience. That audience has a lot um, to share with you, a lot you can gain from the audience. So that's a big problem with, with publishing. And then also, you know, the, the books don't tap the power of the digital age, right? Social media, um, you know, blogging, video, um, you know, podcasting, all of these things are, are huge opportunities to uh, develop a relationship with an audience, to develop a community uh, around an idea, around um, something of interest. Uh, books, you know, typically um, n never ever do that. So that's a huge opportunity. So that was that was why this is why I said I never wanted to do a book. And so, um, and and so what I would say was uh, to several people who would ask, you know, are you going to do a book? I said, no, if I did a book, um, I would just release one chapter at a time on the internet and I would crowdfund it and, uh, and I, wouldn't, I would just skip a publisher altogether. And at the end of the process, I would, I would um, you know, publish it with, uh, publish it on demand, um, self-publish it. And everybody that I would say this to would be like, huh, right? They would look at me like, you're insane. Um, and then, uh, so I had a, um, a writer that came to work for me uh, at Tech Republic uh, who wanted to write a book. And so she said, are you going to ever write a book? And I said, no, I'm not, I'm gonna, not gonna write a book. And I gave my little spiel. And she's like, huh. She's like, now that's a really interesting way um, to do a book. 
And I said, cool. I said, do you, would you want to do it with me? And, uh, and she said, okay. And so I said, great, because I actually have an idea for a book that I wanted to do. I just didn't want to go through all the old kind of, kind of rigmarole, rigmarole. And the idea for the book was this uh, idea called uh, Follow the Geeks. And the, the concept here is, again, you know, the future of work, work is changing considerably, right? Um, you have uh, work is so much more distributed. People are so much more distributed. Uh, you have the fact that, um, you know, the manufacturing base um, is, is changing. There aren't sort of those large swaths of jobs in the same ways there used to be. And the future of work is just a lot more entrepreneurial, right? Uh, there's, there's a quote um, from someone in our book uh, that we'll talk about in a little bit, Chase Jarvis. Uh, you know, he said, you know, our parents had one job. Um, we have five, and our kids will have five at a time. Uh, and I think that um, is very emblematic of the reason why we did this book, which is that work is changing, work is becoming more entrepreneurial, and if you look at people in digital media space, a lot of them have been forced to live this reality um, already. And by looking at 10 of them who've kind of figured it out and done some interesting things, it's a way to share um, some knowledge and some ideas with everybody who in the future is probably going to, um, you know, a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people are going to have to think about what they do in a more entrepreneurial way. Um, whether that means becoming a consultant, um, whether that means, uh, you know, juggling multiple gigs, whether that means starting their own um, small business um, or startup or kickstarting something on the side. Um, or just being more entrepreneurial within their own organization, right? Or a lot of organizations are looking at working in smaller and smaller groups, and they're looking for people who are more entrepreneurial and can think um, that way more end-to-end -end about an idea and not just working their little, their little angle or their little specialty, um, but thinking more holistically, more end-to-end. -end. Um, and then those people become leaders or project managers, you know, in, in large organizations. So across the board... Um, the theory of this book is that the future of work is more entrepreneurial, and here's 10 people who've, who've figured it out. Simple as that. Uh, we did decide to crowdfund it um, using Indiegogo. Uh, we didn't, you know, Kickstarter, we thought about Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a lot more kind of hardware focused kind of projects and, and that kind of thing. So we chose Indiegogo. Indiegogo has a little bit more of a base of like creators and creatives and you know filmmakers and that kind of thing. So we chose Indiegogo um, and we didn't, so, so there were a number of things, we'll talk specifically about crowdfunding in a minute, but um, we, we did that um, and, and there were a number of reasons to crowdfund and it wasn't all about um, money. As a matter of fact, m money was was really like maybe second or third on the list. Um, number one was, let's see if anybody's actually interested in this idea. You know, that's the great thing about crowdfunding is you can put something out there and see like, are there people that actually think this is something they would be worth spending their valuable time and money and resources, um, and th because it could help them. Um, number two is it's an excellent way to build demand for your product, right? By crowdfunding, by putting your product out there, um, one, you can see people are interested and assuming that there are and there are enough people that are interested, you're also building awareness about your product um, in a very powerful way. It gives you something to talk about. It gives you something to talk about on social media. It gives uh, the media um, something to talk about about your project uh, and all of that. So. Uh, and then number three is, you know, it can help fund your idea. You know, creating a book is not a super expensive process. Most of it is the time that you put in. Um, if you have a full-time job, in this case, it's a, you know, nights and weekends thing. It's, you know, you, if you're willing to give up your nights and weekends, you can create a book. Um, but there were some expensive expenses involved. So we came up with this idea of, you know, when you do a book, typically the advance for a book, um, unless you're, you know, Hillary Clinton or something, um, or Bill Clinton, I guess it would be, um, you know, with a, where you have multi-million dollar advances, uh, you know, typical advance for, for a regular book is $10,000. 
That's usually enough to sort of get you started to you know, cover your research costs to you know, your travel and, and all of that kind of thing. So we thought, okay, well, let's just make that the, our crowdfunding goal. Like, that's pretty good. You know, we can sort of, that's an easy story to tell. Like, we're not, gonna, we're not going to go with a publisher. We're going to crowdfund this. And so instead of going to a publisher, we're going to self-publish it. And so we're going to crowdfund what would be the advance of a typical book. So that's what we did. Um, and then the other thing, um, because it's not um, being promoted by sort of the big engine of uh, a publishing house, um, which the dirty little secret in the publishing industry is, they spend very little time promoting. They pick a few books that they put all of their promotional weight behind. And what they do is they see the books that come in, they see if it starts to gain traction, and then they'll maybe put some, some resources behind that. So most books get very little um, support from a publisher. Uh, but that's the only way your book really ever becomes a, a hit, is if it gets promoted. So in addition to crowdfunding, the other way to kind of promote this idea and get it out there and, and build sort of awareness and demand for the book um, was to serial publish it. And the idea was there's a few people who have kind of done something similar, not serial publishing. Serial publishing goes back a long way, right? Um, Charles Dickens popularized it um, or, or made it famous uh, in the 19th century. Um, other famous books um, were serials. In Cold Blood by Truman Capote was serialized in The New Yorker. Um, also, um, uh, a number of books in the, in the 70s. This sort of got a little bit of a revival, especially driven by The New Yorker. Um, Rachel Carson, uh, you know, her, her great environmental work was, uh, was started in The New Yorker as, as, a, um, as a serial um, and then was published uh, later. So, so this idea has been around, but it, it, it hasn't, um, it, it's kind of lost uh, favor in the modern world. But our idea was serial publishing in the modern, you know, now that you have the, the web, much, much easier, right? You have this instant publishing platform uh, to put it on. So, but again, the idea is building kind of awareness, um, building uh, interest, uh, establishing interest, and then sort of also gathering sort of community of people that are interested in this topic and then can, you know, share their wisdom, can, uh, you know, give you ideas, can also, in, in our um, sense, as the, as the last one here, um, give uh, some voice to the topic. So what, we, what we've done is we took every, also there's the fact that the book gets stale, right? As you, the more the information, the longer you have it and you don't publish it, the more stale it gets all the time. So part of our idea with serial publishing was as we finish these chapters, let's just release them for free on a website for a month. And everybody, the number one question everybody asked is, like, if you give it away for free, why is everybody going to buy your book? Right? Logical. Well, what we found was we've seen other people like Cory Doctorow and others who have released all of their books um, for free, um, you know, on the web, and they still sell a lot of books. In fact, Cory argues that uh, giving it away for free is the best marketing that he has for his, his book. He really doesn't do any marketing. He gives them away for free. And people like them so much that then they, they go out and buy the book. Um, Counterintuitive. Uh, we didn't go that far. Um, our idea was we're going to release each chapter as we do it, and we're going to leave it for free on the web until the next chapter comes out. And then when that chapter comes out, we take down the one that was available for free. Chapter one, it, one it, you know, we take it down, and then chapter two is available for free for a month until the next chapter comes up. Then the next chapter comes up, we leave that. So we're, we use them all as kind of taste testers, right? And it kind of works in our case because each one is the story of one person, um, and so it can stand on its own. So if you read chapter three, it's not, it doesn't, if you missed chapters one and two, you know, you're not, um, you didn't lose anything. You're not lost. So, uh, so that's why we decided to, to serial publish it. Um, and when we were about three or four chapters in, um, we had this great uh, insight from one of our community members who was like, you know, I loved, it was chapter four, I think. I loved chapter four. And I want to go back and read those first three. Um, like, what if, if I buy, if I pre-order the book, because we had pre-orders up on our site at that point, 
if I pre-order the book, can I get access to all of the, the archive of all the old chapters? We're like, that's a great idea. So <laughs> that's fantastic. So, so we put the, so we, you know, sent a post, uh, we uh, published a post, and we put a little banner up on the top of a site that said special offer, you know, um, see how you can um, get access to the rest of the chapters. And sure enough, we did that, and all of a sudden, we started getting lots of pre-orders, right? People just um, wanting to read all of those uh, previous chapters uh, online. So again, the audience, you know, by having that interaction with the audience, you get so much um, out of, uh, so much benefit from the ideas of sort of your readers, your, your community. Uh, the other thing that we did as we released these chapters for free is we said, hey, we'd like to hear your feedback. How did this person and their story impact you? How did it relate to your story? Uh, what did you learn from this? What do you think is most significant about what they do? And what we said was, we're going to take the best comments, and when we do the, publish the final version of the book, we're going to publish those comments at the end of each chapter, those insights. We're going to take those best insights and publish them at the end of each chapter. So that's what we've done all along the way. And when the final version is published, you know, at the end of each chapter, we'll have a section where we're going to have insights from the community where they talked about why, you know, they feel this person is influential and important and how their story, you know, has an impact. Uh, so giving them a voice uh, also, you know, I think adds to the, the strength of, of the content, right? Um, we really have gotten very little, you know, kind of trolling even of somebody saying, I think, I mean, maybe I can count on one hand the number of like negative or, um, you know, even um, highly critical comments of, of the people we've published about. I mean, they're all amazing. Uh, they're all awesome. I can talk about who some of them are in a second. But, um, but the great thing is it, it was all really great feedback. So it's going to be kind of tough to choose and narrow down like which, one, which comments, um, which insights to, to add at the end of each chapter, which is a great problem to have. So that was our plan. That was what we have done. We just published chapter nine um, this past week uh, on Leo Laporte, who was the uh, um, uh, longtime tech TV uh, host. Um, he also has his own network, um, This Week in Tech, Twit, uh, the Twit Network, who runs uh, now 25 podcasts. Um, it's a $10 million business. It'll be a $10 million business this year. Pretty good for a little, what well, was a little podcast network, you know, 10 years ago. So um, we have one chapter left, uh, which we'll publish at the end of this month. Um, this person's a bit of a surprise. But uh, the other people that we ha written, have written about, um, chapter one was Bertunde Thurston, um, who worked at The Onion for a long time. He's a digital director of The Onion for a long time. He now works on uh, The Daily Show. Uh, chapter two was Lisa Bettany, who's a, a very famous photographer and also uh, ran a, an app um, called Camera Plus, which was one of the first huge hits, the first kind of million dollar um, strikes in the app store uh, in, in the late um, aughts, the late, uh, like 2009. Um, so uh, she talked about her journey, which has been, which is super interesting. Chapter three um, was Gina Trapani, who was the um, founding editor of Life Hacker. Uh, and now runs a, um, an analytics uh, uh, service that, that connects to social media. Chapter four was Tom Merritt, who uh, was a, also a podcaster, um, for, worked at CNET, was an editor at CNET for a long time, um, and then went off and did a Patreon, and, um, and now has uh, you know, people contributing. Uh, he has about 5,000 contributors, so audience members, that contribute uh, a little bit each month on Patreon. It's another crowd... Um, funding um, source, if you're not familiar with it. Um, they contribute somewhere in the neighborhood of sixteen to $17,000 a month to him um, on Patreon. Uh, he was one of the first big stars on, on Patreon. Patreon's a, you know, a, also an optional crowdfunding one. Chapter five is Veronica Belmont, who's a kind of a, a video uh, star who's, who's really interesting because she has juggled multiple gigs, kind of what we were talking about. She doesn't really work one job anymore. She has multiple jobs, and so she's a perfect example of kind of how to live in, in that world, um, you know, as a freelancer, as it were. Chapter six was Ohm Malik, the founder of GigaOhm, uh, who, you know, last year 
uh, GigaOM went under, and so it was a really kind of amazing story, sometimes sad uh, uh, story with him. Um, but he had this huge hit, and then it kind of fell apart, and so we explore why and how that happened. Uh, chapter seven uh, was Chase Jarvis, who's a, also a very famous photographer. He runs Creative Live now, which is this amazing um, place that you can go to, to learn about uh, Photoshop um, and other specific kind of creative skills. But also, uh, there's lots of um, you know, intangible stuff you can learn there about the creative process and building a business and doing a startup and all those kinds of things. Um, chapter eight was Juliana Rotich, which, who was the uh, founder, one of the co-founders of Ushahidi um, in Africa, which is this uh, really amazing crowd-sourced mapping company, which uh, was huge in um, Kenya, uh, was also huge in India. It's really um, spread all throughout the world. It's especially for you know things like um, elections and crises and things like that, where there are times that uh, you know communication either is down or is unreliable, or the media or the government are unreliable in the information that they present. And so this service allows people to the citizens, it's a citizen journalism platform essentially, allows people to contribute reports um, and then uh, you know, the, for everyone to, to see those, those reports, whether it's aid that's available or um, violence that's happening or you know, potentially even election results. Uh, so, uh, and then chapter nine was Leo Laporte, who I mentioned. Chapter 10 is a bit of a surprise, but um, it, it really is someone that will absolutely blow everyone's socks off. Um, I'll give one hint, I haven't really said this publicly, but um, for the last one, we picked someone who was younger with the idea of you know, looking kind of toward the future and how she's thinking about, see I just even gave another hint that um, uh, it's a woman, um, that she's thinking about what the future looks like and how she's gonna shape her career based on, uh, based on what um, the future looks like. So, uh, two hints for the price of one. Um, that's the project that we did. Uh, Here's what we learned from crowdfunding, because I, I, I'm sure everyone, crowdfunding is an amazing thing. It really is uh, changing the face of, um, of you know, funding, of startups, of entrepreneurialism. So um, it, it's, it's a great, great thing. You know, our crowdfunding campaign, you know, to be honest, um, to, to go back, the one thing I don't have on this list that I would say, I would almost wish we had a little bit longer time to plan it. Um, than we did, so maybe my number one takeaway is give yourself enough time to really plan it and look at what others, you know, who are doing similar projects have learned by doing a project the way you're, you're doing it. And, um, and, and really think it through. Uh, you know, test out some ideas and some scenarios and even, you know, th uh, run them by some people. Run them by friends, family, you know, colleagues, people you trust, um, and get their take on it. Um, what, what we found, so our crowdfunding campaign uh, our, on Indiegogo, we set the, we set the price at, um, that we were trying to raise at 10K, like I said. Um, we actually, we did the, the version where um, it wasn't all or nothing, right? We had to raise 10K or the project wasn't gonna happen. We really didn't, like I said, we didn't necessarily need the money. It was more to fund the research, to fund some travel, um, to, to interview some people and that kind of thing, to fund the price of, of uh, you know, doing the self-publishing, um, especially with paper. You know, you have a little bit of upfront cost with that. Um, that's really all we needed. We ended up raising out of 10,000 goal, 6,000 like 5,800, um, which we were fine with. That was more than enough for what we needed to do, what we needed to do. But it gave us a real chance to evaluate, like, why didn't we raise as much as we thought? Um, like I said, we based that 10,000 on kind of naively. Um, and so that's why I would say I would give it a little more time first to go and see what other people who are doing similar projects were able to raise. Look at your cost and what you would need. Like I said, that was more, that was plenty in terms of what we needed. Um, but where we really were wrong, we talked to some people um, at the Consumer Electronics Show in January at CES while our campaign was still running. Um, we talked to them about, you know, doing the campaign. They were very excited about it. Um, 
But what we, in talking to them, they confirmed for us what we thought was the biggest problem with our campaign. And that's that we didn't get the price right. Uh, which is we set the, you know, the primary good for ours is the ebook. Um, mostly, these are mostly digital people. Um, that's what we thought. We went in thinking the primary good is the ebook uh, because these are mostly digital people and that's what will sell the most. What we sold the most of by far was the hardback. Not surprised, right? When I said even here in this room with a lot of like digital nerds like us, um, most people, more than half of the book, that the most recent book they read was a hardback. So that we didn't realize. Um, and because of that, we set the, the hardback kind of at a really high price, 40 bucks, because printing hardbacks is still really expensive. Um, we set the ebook at 20 bucks, which we thought, you know, that's a little more than what a typical ebook is. But, you know, this is also a crowdfunding campaign. So part of the reason you support a crowdfunding campaign is it's not a consumer good, it's like buying into what you're doing, right? That was the wrong approach. Um, people, when they approach uh, crowdfunding, they still are comparing your good or service, whatever it is, to what the market value of that thing is. And so the one thing the Indiegogo people said to us was like, 20 bucks, too high. They said people are gonna look at that and they're gonna say, I, sp I spend 10 bucks on all my eBooks. You know, why would I spend 20 on yours? We were like, but no, it's about, you know, buying into the, what we're doing and all that. And they said, that's cool, but at the end of the day, still people have, you know, this um, price sensitivity. Like, you can't avoid it. And they were exactly right. Because later when, we, when the campaign was over and we um, put pre-orders up for our books, we put the ebook at $20, from, took it from $20 to $10, we started selling them like nuts. And so... We should have done the crowdfunding campaign. Ultimately, I'm kind of thankful we didn't because you know, we don't have to give all that money to Indiegogo. Like if it would have, we would have sold all the ones that we've sold in pre-order um, on Indiegogo, we would have had to give Indiegogo their cut, you know? So, um, so it worked out fine, um, but that's a, great, um, that's a great example of us not sort of necessarily doing all the due diligence that we needed before we went into the crowdfunding campaign. Um, okay, the other is, you know, with crowdfunding campaign, if you're doing one, it kind of all hinges on the video, ultimately. You have to do a really great, like, three to four minute pitch video. Uh, ours is okay. It's pretty good. I mean, it's still up there. You can see it if you want. I think it's fine. But, again, if we had more, if we had, if we had given ourselves a longer runway to, for the campaign, I think we could have done a much better video. One thing to do in the video, um, my, my second point was um, explain where the money goes as we talk to people after we had the campaign up and we sort of asked them, like, what do you think about this? Like, no, what do you really think about this, you know? Um, one of the things that people brought up again and again was wanting to know and understand, like, where, what is this actually going toward? And so we talked about that in the video, but I felt like, you know what, we probably should have driven that home a little more. Um, because people were really curious about that. They want to know, where is their ten, what is their 10 bucks doing? Um, because at the same time, it's sort of this weird dichotomy, right? At the same time, they, don't, they want to pay market price for a good, and they think that it's, that's what it's about. They also want to know, like, yeah, why are you crowdfunding? Like, what's the purpose of all this? What, what is my money? What's my 10 bucks or 20 bucks or 40 bucks, you know, going toward? Um, and then the other, sort of my last big takeaway uh, in terms of crowdfunding, is um, be careful about not turning yourself into a network marketer, right? Like, um, and I forgive me if there's anybody that's like Amway in here, but like you, the worst thing is that when you have a crowdfunding campaign and your friends or family, like you come to talk about the crowdfunding campaign, they look at you like, oh, it's that person who's going to try to, you know, get me into Amway. Right, like here they come again, they're gonna talk about their thing and they want me to give money um, to whatever it is. It's a great way, you know, network marketing is a great way to you know, uh, alienate friends and family and crowdfunding campaign, if you're not careful, can be the exact same, right? People see you coming and they're like, oh no, here they come, they're gonna give me the pitch. Uh, so be, um, be careful about that. Um, yeah, that's, that's the story. I, that said, I highly recommend crowdfunding. Uh, like I said, the, the opportunity to engage with your audience, to, to get that, do that market research to see if there's, there's 
um, interest in what you do or what you want to do is invaluable, and it really is a great way to develop that community, to uh, engage with um, you know people that are um, potential audience, but also can give you feedback that can really change what you do. Like that person who suggested to us, hey, why don't you, um, what about everybody that pre-orders the book, they can get access to the archive of online chapters. That was fantastic. And that really, I mean, pre-orders were already doing great, but when that happened, that just took it to a, a, you know, a whole nother level. And so, and that was just from some great feedback from a reader. Uh, so, so, you know, for, if you're interested in learning more about the project, you can find that at followthegeeksbook.com. Um, also on Twitter at followthegeeks. You can find or, uh, me on Twitter at Jason Heiner. Um, and other than that, I'm happy to, uh, to take some questions.